Um, firstly, good afternoon everyone and thank you for registering to today's webinar. Uh, before we commence the webinar, just a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, I sent out an email earlier on today attaching today's presentation, plus details of the teleconference. Uh, in the unlikely event that the webinar does cut out, listeners can dial in, so don't be alarmed if there's a cut out, you can still dial in via the teleconference call. Um, the number to dial, just in case you didn't receive that email, is 02829727000. I'll repeat that again, 02829727000. And the actual PIN or code uh, to join the teleconference is 11787. I'll repeat that again, 11787. Um, today's webinar will be focused on opportunities in global markets and investment choice and superannuation. Historically, many Australian investors have an overweight position in their super fund, or their investments mostly in Australian equities, particularly in the four major banks such as NAB, CBA, Westpac, and ANZ, and mining companies such as Rio and BHP. While it's important to have exposure to Australian shares, whether that be direct or via a fund manager, it's important not to ignore the opportunities overseas. The Australian market accounts for only 2% of the world investment market, and by only focusing here in our backyard, we may be ignoring opportunities overseas. Without being stock specific, you only need to look at the companies or products and services we use every day. Companies that come to mind are Microsoft, Sony, Facebook, Apple, and Nestle, to name a few. Before we move on to our webinar, I'd like to point out that the information provided in today's webinar is in general in nature and was prepared without taking into consideration your personal objectives, financial situation or needs. You should, before acting on the information presented to you today, consider the appropriateness of this information having regard to your objectives, financial situation and needs. Where the information presented relates to a financial services product, you should obtain a copy of the relevant product disclosure statement before making any financial decisions. Above all, seek financial advice before making any investment decisions from a qualified professional such as a financial planner. The agenda for today's webinar will be in two parts. The first part will be on investment opportunities in global markets, and the second part will be on investment choice and superannuation. So to help investors understand the opportunities in global markets, we have a real treat today and I have the honour of introducing Andrew Clifford from Platinum Asset Management. Andrew is the Chief Investment Officer at Platinum Asset Management. Platinum Asset Management is an A6 listed company and one of Australia's leading fund managers specialising in international markets. Platinum currently manages $25 billion on behalf of investors worldwide. By way of background, Andrew joined Platinum Asset Management as a founding member in 1994 the capacity of Director and Deputy Chief Investment Officer and was previously Vice President of Bankers Trust Australia covering Asian equities and managing BT Select Master Trust Pacific Basin Fund. Andrew was also manager for the Platinum Asia Fund from inception of the fund in 2003 until December 2014 and is co-manager of the Platinum International Fund. So without further more to say, I'd like to pass you on to Andrew. Good afternoon everyone and, and thank you for your time today. Just to give you a brief outline of, of what I'll be talking about, I'm, I'm going to start uh, by, by quickly taking you through Platinum's investment approach and I want to do that for two reasons. One, so you can understand exactly how we get to uh, looking at some of the opportunities that I'm going to be outlining later and also as I hope that it might help give you uh, an additional framework or way of thinking about your own investing. After doing that, I'll set the scene in terms of the big picture for markets globally before going on to some of the key opportunities in markets as we see it today. I'll be talking about China, uh, European banks and a number of technology stocks. Uh, I'll finish with some comments on the Australian dollar and the relative merits of investing in Australia as we see it versus global markets. So 
if any of you have ever heard one of our presentations, you know, over the last 20 years or so, you probably would have started with a chart that looks something like this. Um, what it represents is our view of the way, very sort of uh, succinctly, the way markets deal with individual stocks or um, industries at different times. The starting point is this, the market is generally pretty efficient, but from time to time we'll put too much emphasis on short-term or transitory information. Bad news will overly depress share prices. Uh, it's a good example of any is in the GFC, while there were very serious problems in the financial system uh, around the world, ultimately it was one of the great buying opportunities of equities uh, in our time. Um, at the same time, good news will be greeted too enthusiastically and prices will be pushed up too far. And probably the great example uh, of recent years was the tech bubble. Uh, and interestingly, when you look at the tech bubble, you go back to that period in 2000, all of the things that we talked about, about back then, about how the internet was going to change everything, how we'd be using our mobile phones to access the internet. The interesting thing is that that all happened, in fact it happened far more so than one would have ever expected uh, at that time. And yet all of the stocks that people bought back then that were going to benefit from that, many of them are still well below the highs they set back in 2000 and 2001. So when we look at markets today and we think about what the key concerns are, they can really probably be put into two, two key areas. One is the indebtedness in the Western economies, whether that's in the US where debt has been transferred since the GFC from households and corporates into the government's hands, um, or in Europe where a similar process has gone on, or Japan where that process has been underway for 20 odd years. The other issue though that has concerned a lot of us, especially in Australia, over the last two or three years has been the slowdown in China. Um, and certainly I'll be talking a bit more about that in a moment. But if you bring these two concerns together, what it all leads to one, uh, sort of a, the conclusion one gets to, is that world economic growth looks like it's going to be muted for some time to come. It also, these concerns are reinforcing uh, the high degree of risk aversion that investors have felt since uh, the GFC. So where has that taken markets to? Well, if we look at the bond market, for example, and on the chart we have here, we have uh, US interest rates, the US Treasury market, uh, with the yield inverted. So as that line goes higher, interest rates are getting lower and lower. And basically, this market has been in a 35-year bull market. Uh, if you look at interest rate markets around the world, they're all essentially essentially at lifetime, interest rates are at lifetime lows. And what this has done is it's driven people into the equity market it, despite being reluctant perhaps to do so. But in doing so, trying to stay away from risk, staying away from uncertainty, investors have favoured those types of companies with highly certain outcomes and avoided uncertainty as much as they can. And what we see this creating is a huge dispersion in valuations and thus potential returns. So to give you an example of companies, Nestle is a favourite amongst many who are looking for highly reliable and safe investments. The company today trades on 21 times earnings, uh, but in fact this business has barely grown at all over the last five years. On the other hand, Samsung Electronics, a business that has grown at 50% over those same five years, although it has done so with a huge degree of, degree of variability with a couple of down years in those earnings, today trades on eight times earnings. What this implies for Nestle is really a return through time of a little under 4% per annum as it's not growing, whereas Samsung is giving you a starting earnings yield of 12% but it's one that is most certainly growing, if not in a straight line. What this tells us is as an investor today, 
if you focus on the out of favour stocks and you are prepared to take on some of this uncertainty, you are going to be rewarded through time with a far better return. So to try and, and bring this into a, a little more clarity in terms of looking at individual opportunities that are out there uh, and how this um, approach of looking for the out of favour stock, looking today uh, in particular where, where there is any uncertainty, um, I'll take you through what we're seeing happening in China, uh, European banks and, and some of our technology stocks. So if we go to China, I think it is, it's undoubtedly the case that the economy has slowed down and has been doing so for the last two to three years. The great investment boom uh, that has gone on since uh, the early 2000s is coming to an end. Property, the construction of residential property has undoubtedly seen its peak volumes of 12, 13, 14 million units a year if we go back to 2012. I just say as an aside, we don't believe the property market is over there, but will we ever build as many apartments in one year again, we think is unlikely. Anyway, the result of all of this, this slowdown and investment in steel and other heavy industries, cement, um, aluminium, there's all sorts of areas where there will be, be too much capacity and there will be bad debts uh, for the banking system going forward. And of course, we've all seen the reality of this in our own economy with the impact on iron ore prices and coal prices, as well as other commodities. But here is the thing. This slowdown in China is not a mystery to anyone anywhere in the world. And indeed, if you look at the Chinese stock market and you go back just over a year ago, that market ranked as one as one of the worst uh, performing stock markets in history. From six and a half years from its peak, it fell at a rate of 14% per annum, which is getting up to close to a 70% loss. There have been some worse losses, such as uh, in the US in the 30s, um, but that was a very sharp loss of, uh, at that time, 90% bounced back to be nowhere near as badly off um, uh, as any investor in China. So the market clearly understands or understood there's a problem. Now we've had a very good bounce in China since then, but I think if any of you are following the commentary on that in the financial pages, you'll hear many people uh, questioning the longevity of that. Uh, we think otherwise. And one of the reasons is this, is that indeed there's large parts of that economy that are not performing well, but there are many others that are actually continuing to grow very strongly. One of these is the internet and any business being driven by the internet. So on this next chart, if we look particularly on the right hand side, you can see the usage of the internet on mobile phones continues to exaggerate, uh, accelerate very quickly. On the left hand side, it just shows you how over the last five years, the number of users connected to the internet in China has doubled. And it's important in this economy, as it is in many emerging economies, more so than our own experience of joining the net. Because for many people, it's access to information for the first time. So we see in many places, small businesses, particularly farmers, for example, being able to make decisions about their business. They're gaining information about how to plant crops or how to raise chickens or whatever it is that allows them to do a better job or even just enter that business. It allows them to work out market prices and where they best transact in selling their livestock or produce. And it also is giving them a mechanism by which they can pay or be paid for that. And we see across the emerging world, not just in China, a whole range of new businesses being created simply because they now have this ability to connect. Many of the things that we would have used, like our banking systems uh, or government uh, agencies to help us do a lot of things, just haven't been available. So this is indeed very important. But we can sort of look at it more broadly in the Chinese economy that um, there are many interesting things still going on. So if we look at the express parcel deliveries, now this is clearly uh, a function of, again, the internet and e-commerce and 
you know, China has gone from essentially having almost no e-commerce, no retail sales over the internet in 2009 to a point where at 10% of retail, it is essentially right up there with, uh, you know, some of the more developed markets. And so what we see is in 2014, the number of express parcel deliveries went from 9 billion a year to 14 and continues to grow in the first quarter this year at a similar rate, despite the fact other parts of the economy are slow. Similar things can be said about the Chinese outbound tourists, up from 98 million to 117 million. Uh, last week, I was in China visiting Tuna, who are a, an internet-based travel service company. Essentially, they're, they're most like uh, TripAdvisor but they are very much a platform, the leading platform people book their airline tickets uh, and hotels through in China. And they've seen no slowdown whatsoever, um, despite looking hard to find it. Uh, similar things can be said about car sales or box office revenues, an industry that grew at nearly 50% last year. People going to the movies is a new thing and it grows quickly. Uh, it's continued to grow quickly this year. In infrastructure, while there may not be as much building of, uh, of, of residential apartments, if we look at other critical infrastructure, many of the um, things that were built a decade ago, which were believed that they would be white elephants, airports, uh, fast rail systems, um, roads, you'll find generally today are highly utilised and in fact in many cases needing additional investment. The subway is a good example where we now have um, 2,700 kilometres worth of subway has been built in the last decade across China and there will be ongoing investment in this area. And yet, in Beijing, the subway um, delivers a billion, billion trips a year and is basically packed to sort of crush levels much of the day as per as sort of the images that we have of the, the subway in Tokyo. So despite the slowdown in, in what we traditionally think about what's going on in China, many things are growing. So we then come down to though, when we invest, it's all very well that all these good things are happening, but what are we paying for that? What's the price for these businesses? And the next chart shows you some of the, the, um, the variables around the companies that we have in our portfolio. Um, and what, what it, this chart shows is that very healthy growth rates for many of these businesses and yet we're paying multiples that are well below what their peers trade in, at in the rest of the world. So to just quickly run you through uh, three examples, uh, a Guaijo Mutai, which is the, is the manufacturer and distributor of the Mutai liquor. Here's a company, it's a national brand. It has grown traditionally at very fast rates, so up around 18, 20%. It's had a setback recently due to the corruption crackdown. It was a favoured way of bribing officials. But this stock um, has an extraordinarily strong position uh, in its business. It's very profitable. Um, and it has had a big run up this year in its stock price, but today still trades at a P of 18. So in the West, you know, we might compare that to the Nestle's that I was, Nestle I was talking about earlier. Uh, here's a company, you're paying a lower rate, it has superior uh, qualities in terms of its uh, profitability, but will grow at, at we think, a mid-team uh, rate uh, for quite a few years to come. Uh, Baidu is the Google of China. Um, this company is you know, growing very quickly as people take up their mobile phones and use the internet and as we do here, search for whatever it is they're looking for. This company is trading at a P of 23 times and indeed we think the earnings are understated because like internet companies around the world, they invest in many new areas, uh, suppressing their profits, but it has been growing at rates of 50% uh, in recent times. So again, we think a great investment. PICC, the leading insurance company in uh, China, it is, again, it's one of these interesting areas where, so their property and casualty insurance 
auto insurance is the big line, but it's now branching out to a whole lot of other areas like household contents, agriculture, uh, and other lines. But we're at a point in the country's development where if you went back a decade ago, whether it was life insurance or, or uh, general insurance, people had very little to insure. Today, as people start to accumulate wealth, they want to protect their possessions or protect uh, the future of their families uh, from potential misfortune. And insurance is an area that's growing quickly. Uh, there's a small number of very strong companies and they're very profitable. So again, we think this on 14 times is, uh, you know, potentially what was, is providing us with excellent returns um, given profitability and growth characteristics. As a final note, and you'll see later that we actually have a very significant part of our international fund in China. It is approximately 25% of all of our money invested in the A-share market in China, uh, but also many companies that are listed in Hong Kong and NASDAQ in the US. Now, people might think that that's a large amount of money to have, but what I can tell you is today that China represents 15% of world market capitalization. So, not that we're very much into indices and weightings, but it is actually a reality that you know China is one of the big stock markets uh, of the world today. To move on to other areas, perhaps not quite as exciting, uh, are European banks. And we know that the banks in Europe have been at the centre of, of the problems in that region. Um, Clear concerns have been bad debts. So if we look at of what we show on this chart is one of our, our bigger holdings in Europe, in Tessa, San Paolo, which is an Italian bank. Uh, it's one of two very, what we believe, two of the very high quality banks in that country. Um, and it's interesting because it, it did go through, as you know, most of you have a very poor cycle in terms of uh, credit losses in its... Uh, business with lots of bad debts. But what this chart here shows is that if you look at the, the full length of that bar chart is how little the profitability of this business actually fluctuated through one of the most dramatic downturns uh, in the finance uh, business that we've seen. Yes, they did have to take through some additional provisions, but when we were buying this stock two years ago, they had already uh, counted written off as much as 10% of their loan portfolio and clearly that was coming to an end. Besides the concerns about bad debts, there were concerns about interest rate margins as interest rates fell to zero around capital adequacy. Um, this is a, a story told about you know, banks around the world. But in Europe two years ago, as I said, we were buying this bank at around 6% of book value. Now, it's actually already made us some good money and we have start to sell a little bit of, of it, although at a small premium to book value, we don't think it's particularly expensive. However, the opportunity continues to present itself. So we have been, while reducing in Tessa, adding to other uh, banks, um, in particular Erste, which is a, uh, an Austrian bank, though it has uh, significant businesses in Eastern Europe, which have been, had more significant bad debt issues to get beyond. Uh, and recently OTP, a Hungarian bank, um, again, much later in the cycle of recovery. But these are, are very strong banks. Um, we're buying them for relatively little compared to their book value and uh, at this point of recovery. So it doesn't feel particularly pleasant buying into to something that, you know, is having those sort of problems. But again, I, I'd emphasise that's where the opportunities to make money are is to take that on, take that. It's everyone else's fear and concern is what provides us with the opportunity uh, to make uh, superior returns. <clears throat> Finally, the, the last uh, specific uh, area I'd like to talk about is uh, our group of technology stocks. And again, if we go back to the tech. Uh, tech boom back in 2000. These were the four uh, great companies of the internet boom. Cisco, Intel, Microsoft and Oracle. And what 
we would say about each of these companies is they are each dominant in their sector of their business. But also, if, if you think about each of them or know a little bit about it, any, any of these, they've all faced key threats to their business that are causing people some concern. So Microsoft, for example, everyone is concerned they've lost the consumer uh, to Apple and Android. And yet, it misses the very point that this company really is an enterprise software company. It is the leading provider of cloud-based software uh, services along with Amazon. And indeed, um, we think will continue to grow nicely. Now, Microsoft's actually been, is, is a relatively old holding in our portfolio. And again, it's one that we're starting to sell uh, as it has, a, has reached a reasonably fair valuation. But nevertheless, 19 times, again, it compares very favourably to some of the other types of safe stocks that are out there and where people are paying high prices for a lot less growth. Um, Cisco, Intel, Oracle, I can tell the stories for each. Intel have lost the microprocessor market in phones um, to the ARM chip, and yet, in fact, we believe they're well positioned to fight back in that market. Oracle, who are a provider of databases to enterprise systems, are threatened by changes to the cloud. Uh, Cisco, who are the providers of networking equipment that basically bring all our networks together and are essentially a dominant global player here, are uh, under threat from a, a new technology called software defined networking. Yet our work shows that indeed we think this is as much an opportunity for that company as it is a threat. So I'd now like to talk just briefly about Australia and how we think that compares with the opportunities that are out there in uh, global markets. Australia has in fact been one of the great economies of the last uh, two and a half decades and one of the great stock markets indeed as well. It came through the GFC with barely a scratch, um, certainly helped out by China's yeah. boom. And we, if we go back to our, you know, although in recent, you know, last two, three years, that uh, sense of, um, you know, greatness is perhaps starting to fade a bit. So if you go back to my very first chart and we talk about you know, the euphoric stage, I think Australia's well past that. Um, but indeed, it has been a good market. And so you can look at a, a favourite stock of, of most investors in this market, uh, CBA, Commonwealth Bank. It's beaten one of the great markets in that time, the S&P, by a very decent margin. But here is the interesting thing to think about with CBA, because when I talk to investors, <coughs> what I hear always about it is the great dividend yield. Matter of fact, I can't, I can't dispute that it's there. But investors really need to think not about what that yield is, but just how sustainable it is and what is driving that business and what's behind it. And I'm not here to tell you that it's not sustainable, but what I would say is that it does worry me that people are focused purely on that yield. That is what is driving them into stocks like CBA or other safe yielding stocks and not thinking enough about what is behind it. Um, there's another issue with, with Australia and Australian investors which stands out to us. Now all investors will have a bias towards their home market. It's always the case and often it's driven by tax advantages of the home market, which is certainly the case here in Australia. But what the numbers show is typical investors uh, have well over 50% of their assets or their equities uh, in Australia. And yet it's only two or so percent of the world market, which is an extraordinarily biased position to have. Um, really, there is nowhere else in the world where people have this bias to their home market. And it's our view, very simply, that in terms of the the, the opportunities offshore in terms of the nature of industries, uh, in terms of the dynamism of places like China or India, um, that 
that much is missing from local portfolios due, due to this home bias. Of course, the other, the other issue for Australian investors when looking offshore is the Australian dollar. And indeed, it's taken a good hit against the US dollar down to around 77 cents of US uh, from well over a dollar not that long ago. Um, but in reality, what we would observe is the Australian dollar has taken a hit, but it's in line with our terms of trade. So the strength, the, it really just reflects the weakness so far only of our commodities. And we would observe, as you can see on this chart, that our terms of trade, trade are still at relatively favourable levels. Uh, that change in focus in China's economy, we think, will continue to mean that our terms of trade are under pressure. But also, uh, when we look around the world, the game of currencies is really one, has become one of central banks uh, in the US, uh, in Europe, in Japan, competing to devalue uh, and debase their currency through the printing of money. Now Australia hasn't done that and hasn't had to do that and that has led uh, to a great deal of the relative strength in the currency we've seen. So while it is weakened against the US, um, if you look at charts of it against other, other currencies like the yen and the euro, it's over a period of time that weakness is not so apparent. The RBA, we think, is in a difficult position here. On one level, the economy is soft and it wants to cut rates. On the other hand, if it cuts rates, it risks, um, uh, you know, continuing to support what looks to be a pretty excited property market um, in parts of the country, at least. We do think that, you know, this is longer term, a risky position. We haven't been through the sort of housing adjustment that other other markets have, and indeed, as a no prediction that that is coming today or tomorrow, but I indeed think it is one of the weaknesses of of the economy and the country. And again, I think it advocates we lead us to advocate for an ongoing uh, decent position in offshore currencies. In the short term, the Australian dollar may rally on enthusiasm about China making a recovery. That wouldn't surprise us. But over a five-year view and beyond, we certainly still believe it makes good sense not to have uh, too much in the way of Australian dollars in your portfolio. So finally, just to sort of wrap up um, on, on all of this and looking at our portfolio, Today, we have uh, in our international fund 37% in Asia. 25% of that, as I've mentioned earlier, is in Greater China, um, which includes Taiwan and Hong Kong, but it is predominantly mainland China businesses. Uh, India, we have 5% there, and while I've spoken very little about that, it is one of the great uh, investment opportunities we think of the next decade where we have a country simply where if the government can remove obstacles to investment, we will get very strong growth. Uh, and there are parts of that economy or that market that are attractively priced. And Korea, which is a market where valuations are at extraordinarily low levels, uh, is that country is hurt by the slowdown in international trade, but nevertheless has a uh, sort of a ever sort of a developing and growing domestic economy. And we indeed think that um, in that country, whether it's Samsung Electronics, which I mentioned earlier, or the banks there, very strongly positioned banks, they wouldn't look that dissimilar in their, their, their disposition to our banks, and yet they trade on P's of seven and uh, at big discounts to book value. Um, So they're the, the, key, the key features of, of the positioning in the portfolio. Um, Japan is another place that I haven't mentioned and that we remain quite enthusiastic about. Uh, as companies there, again, trade very cheaply. 
the depreciation of the yen is a very big boost to that economy and to their earnings. Um, and we think, again, um, a place that will contribute nicely to our returns. Um, in summary, just to sort of look at look at our returns, um, I think you know we would say that over a, a very long period of time, you know we have outperformed the market uh, very handsomely. the The idea of going against um, the grain, going against the the consensus position, we think is a very uh, strong uh, approach to investing, and it has worked. Um, for those of you who are more familiar with our short-term numbers, over the last uh, five years, we have been uh, underperforming the market um, of the order of about 2% per annum. Um, now, we've still been making very good money, but it's not been as good as the index. And that really is a function of what has been happening in the world in terms of the desire of people to look for certainty. Our approach is very much to seek out the opposite, and the market hasn't particularly worked in our favour. Um, however, we have achieved these returns while having a, a fairly low invested position. We have not been fully invested, um, and we've achieved it while not being in the type of stocks while they've returned well, we perceive to have the high, high risk. So thank you very much uh, for uh, listening today. Um, much appreciated. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hopefully uh, you've all got uh, something out of Andrew's presentation with respect to uh, in investment opportunities in um, the global markets. Um, what to do now is just, uh, uh, unfortunately, due to the large numbers of people that have registered on our webinar, we won't be uh, taking any uh, direct questions. So if you do have a specific question that you wish to uh, have answered, by all means, please direct these to me offline. I'll, I'll provide my details at the end of the presentation. So you can either drop me an email or give me a call. However, what I have done is prepared some um, questions for Andrew, which I thought would be of interest to investors and probably might be going some of the ground that Andrew has gone through, but I thought it would be ideal uh, to perhaps elaborate uh, more on um, his part of the presentation. So, uh, Andrew, the, the issues in Europe have been well documented and especially Greece with their debt situation. Um, uh, what's your view of how the European markets will perform over the next 12 months? Yeah, so it's, you know, the markets have had a very good run <coughs> in, in recent times um, in response to uh, the printing of money by the, the ECB. I think um, what we see is that you know uh, valuations are still pretty attractive in parts of the market, particularly as I was mentioning before, the banks. So we'd be reasonably optimistic about, about uh, how Europe travels uh, uh, from here. I think that uh, just some comments on Europe in terms of the, the, the broader economy, I, I don't think it's always appreciated um, uh, just how this situation is actually improving there. So for example, you know, much of Europe, most countries in Europe are now running a current account surplus. And the significance of that only is that they're not reliant on the outside world outside of Europe, but certainly not outside of their own boundaries to fund, uh, you know, that economy on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, some of the economies that sort of had the deep recessions early on, like Ireland, uh, are growing. Um, so while it's been difficult, there have been changes, even at a, what people still point to the fiscal position of many governments. The, the reality is there have been big changes in places like Spain and Italy, either bringing in new taxes, or, or cutting back on uh, spending, trying to be more efficient in their government spending. But of course, as economies go backwards, you know, it doesn't appear to get any better because of, of the way, uh, you know, the existing taxes fall away or existing spending programs lift. So underlying, uh, you know, the, the, 
the problems you've had, there has been what we'd see as a structural improvement. So I think ultimately what, what we'll get is, um, as we have seen in the US a year, maybe, maybe a bit longer down the track, we'll start to see an economic recovery, and then you'll start to see, um, you know, that come through your earnings and for the lifts of the market. As for Greece, um, I think it probably isn't relevant as what, what Greece does in the major scan of things. And there's certainly been enough people worried about it to know that markets are, you know, it may still cause some disruption if they were to exit with and that's probably not likely, but we'll see. Um, so Andrew, you, you talked a lot about, about China in the presentation and um, I suppose you uh, briefly touched on um, India. So. Uh, what's your view in the other Asian markets, in particular uh, India and uh, Japan? So, look, I'll talk a little bit about India first. I mean, we've got, you know, it's an interesting place because really it is just been government getting in the way of things happening in, in this country. So, one of my sort of favourite anecdotal pieces of evidence, um, some work done by uh, one of the brokers there, is that if you look at a you go out to rural areas and you look at a village which has uh, been connected with a paved road, has a um, has access to a mobile telephone tower, has electricity for you know 12 hours a day, um, and then you compare that with a village 10 kilometres away that has none of those things. So it, it has a, it's poorly connected by roads, no mobile phone reception, no electricity at all. The difference in property values can be, you know, four to ten times. And simply, you know, what's happening in these villages is they're connected with mobile phones and a bit of electricity um, and a road is that they're, they're finding opportunities in commerce just because of the natural entrepreneurial nature of people. So one of the biggest growing industries in, in India has been chicken farming. Because once you've got those three things, you can learn how to farm. You can know, raise chickens, you can work out what the input prices are, you can work out well to sell them, you can put them on the truck and get them to the market and you get someone to pay you if you've got the internet connection. So Modi as a PM is a is a unusual in, in a number of ways. One, uh, he's an experienced politician so he knows how India works and he's got a very good idea of, you know, there's some great, we had a half an hour, some great anecdotal stories about how he's changing just the workings of government. You know, but you know, basically, he's uh, got his ministers turning up at the office at eight o'clock anymore every morning instead of playing golf because they know he might call. And he doesn't get his secretary to call; he calls them himself. Um, but he he has got the insights of the changing, and he understands the basics of economics that you need investment. Mm -hmm. And so, we think that there is, um, you know, a, a huge potential here. Of course. It's still difficult, but he was also elected with an extraordinary majority. So we're very hopeful that India will work. Uh, that a lot of there will be a lot of change. We have investments in a, a number of infrastructure companies that have been hit not just by high interest rates, but by a failure of the government to deliver. So power companies that can't get access to coal to burn their, to, their, to you know, put in their new power stations. Um, Japan is is. Uh, you know, has long been interesting to us, and it's the same. There's this, I, I guess, at the core of it is a story of um, you know slow economic reform, but, but probably more about corporate reform and the way companies see their their role in the economy. The, you know, many of them have been very profitable, but have invested just for the sake of it, rather than giving money back to shareholders. You know, we do slowly see that changing, and so. The moment, you know, we might one of our drug companies there that has you know, some interesting drugs, but the other day, you know, announced a new policy around dividends, and you know, we've had a 15-20% move in that stock very quickly. So that um, the, 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 the policies of the RBA government do seem to be working and getting a little more momentum into the economy. Um, so you know, we remain pretty optimistic about Japan's uh, prospects. Um, I know you briefly touched um, on the Australian dollar relative to the US dollar, but uh, how do you see that relative to other major currencies? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, if you look at um, 
the fall of the Australian dollar, say, against the euro, really, well, you get, there'll be periods where it has fallen a lot, but in reality, there's not been a huge change uh, against the euro. The euro has really been falling faster. Uh, similarly, the yen. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's really against the US dollar, and probably more importantly, the Chinese Rupinbi that is, um, it's been holding up again. I mean, it has fallen against. So, we, we suspect that there is, you know, as a result of that, there is sort of further weakness in the Australian, uh, Australian dollar over a few years. But, you know, is it this next six months? It, it need not be. Well, I suppose this is the uh, question that we all want to ask, and it's probably the, in our case, the million dollar question. Okay. Um, so where's the smart money going in, in global markets? Um, I suppose what should investors be looking for? Yeah, yeah I think um, where the money has been going, as opposed to where I think it should go, you know, it obviously has been going into lots of safety first time investments, um, into the bond markets, into uh, the, the, the very reliable companies. But as I've said, I think, you know, there is a growing where, where the money is now starting to go to, where the, the sort of the leading investors are moving towards is really Japan at the moment. Um, but as we obviously think is that is beyond that, it is uh, it is going to be about China. And um, you know, there is another element to the Chinese story that I think you will start to see play out over the next six months in in the financial pages, and that is. The internationalisation of the Chinese Renminbi. So there's a vote coming up in November around uh, them being introduced to the IMF's uh, SDR, which is this uh, uh, you know, global currency unit. It's in itself not that important, but if it's introduced into that, then it will start to become part of the reserves of central banks. Uh, there will be really a requirement for them to open their capital markets fully, and we think, you know, well, there is a view, and it's not particularly our view, but there is a view, I think, from some pretty smart people out there that, you know, what we are going to see is that uh, an enormous amount of money going into China, it's not only their stock market, uh, but into their bond market as it opens up, uh, because the returns there are certainly uh, somewhat more appealing than bond markets. You can have a lot of alternatives elsewhere. So I think that's going to be one of the interesting things to watch. So the, the politics of it are interesting. Clearly, the US don't want this to occur, but um, they refused to let the Chinese into the Asian Development Bank, so they created their own. Um, and the Asian Development Bank has become sidelined somewhat by that. So it'll be very interesting what the IMF, voted the IMF in November, how that unfolds. Um, just another quick question. Um, uh, I know it's not up there, but... And I know you got platinum and you sell focus on the international markets, but uh, just very quickly, the, the Australian market, um, uh, how you sort of see that play out over the next um, 12 months? Yeah, so I, look, I mean, in many respects, it's the market I know the least about, um, but if I think in terms of the very large stocks in the market, I, I as I sort of, sort of, I guess, said before in the presentation, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the idea of the Australian banks. Um, I think they have just become a default option in everyone's portfolio for the yield, and I think that just means there's a there's a bit of over enthusiasm for that idea. Of course, you know, I'm not predicting. I, I don't have the, the insights to predict any great downturn in their earnings or anything like that. But I just know that investors everywhere are, open, and so that worries me. On the other side. The sort of areas where you might hope for something to be a bit better, say the commodity stocks, so BHP. Um, you know, the problem is that you know our story around China is not so much about it growing faster, but it's just growing differently. And undoubtedly, they will continue to consume very large quantities of steel, and thus our our iron ore. But I'm not sure if that's going to grow a great deal. And supply side is. Uh, of iron ore, as it's fairly apparent from Mr. Forrest's uh, protestations, <laughs> um, is is not great. So 
I, I, I'd have a fairly subdued view on, on the broad Aussie market because I think the banks are pretty well owned and even if their, their valuations are okay, I don't think they're terrific. Um, and on the other side where we might hope for a recovery out of um, BHP and the resource stocks, so I'm not awfully hopeful of too much coming from that part of the market. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew, for your insights uh, uh, in the global markets and, um, and your comments on the Australian market. Um, I'm sure you'll agree, uh, listeners, that um, it's been a great opportunity to have Andrew uh, go through uh, the opportunities in the investment markets. I know Andrew has to run, so we'll let him um, go to his meeting. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew, and I would certainly appreciate your time. You know, thank you, everyone, everyone for listening. Um, so you've heard from Andrew and uh, about investment opportunities overseas in the global markets and what I'd like to quickly do now is uh, run through investment choice and superannuation. Um, so just some basic facts, it's roughly around about 1.6 trillion super. Uh, most people have a, a super account, uh, whether that be an industry fund, uh, corporate uh, super fund, self-managed super fund, or we happen to work in government defined benefit. Um, I suppose a, uh, a fact that sort of uh, is a worrying fact is that more than 50% of Australians don't know where the super fund is. And more importantly, over 80% of those don't know what their super balance is invested in. And over 90% are invested in the, uh, the super fund's default investment option. And unfortunately, only 10% make it an active investment choice. And I suppose a worrying sign that we're also seeing is those uh, investors out there that are setting up a self-managed super fund are only invested in cash. So typically super funds uh, will have a default option uh, in the event of the investor not making any active investment choice, uh, which they will allocate your money to their preferred default investment option. So if we look at the various funds that are available out there uh, in the uh, industry super fund space, uh, majority of investors will be invested in a diversified investment option. Uh, if you're in a corporate super master fund, uh, it will either be a diversified investment option or what we call life stages, and we'll go through that in more detail, what that contains. And obviously, if you're setting up a self-managed super fund, as part of a requirement, you do need to set up a, a cash account. Um, so uh, default there would be uh, having your money in cash. So a diversified option, uh, typically they invest money in a variety of asset classes such as fixed interest, cash, property and shares. And a typical example of a diversified investment option is a balanced fund, which is um, made up of 70% uh, in aggressive assets uh, such as shares and property and 30% in conservative assets such as fixed interest and in cash. However, with the introduction of my super, uh, with some of the default uh, super funds, uh, have opted to go down a different track and they've gone down a track of what we call uh, a life stages uh, default investment option. And so what is life stages and how does it work? Uh, life stages invest in your super based on the decade here you were born and the investment mix automatically adjusts as you get older. So if we look at the example of the slide, we have Sarah, John and Rose. Sarah is 27 years old and based on her age, um, she'll be invested in uh, the My Super 1980s Life Stage Fund. Um, that fund is uh, obviously designed for younger members who are, are a long way from retirement, and typically that investment mix will be more growth orientated. So, uh, obviously, on target, try and achieve higher returns over a long period of time. We then have John, who's 47 years old. Uh, he was born in 1966, and based on his age, he'll be invested in the My Super. 1960s Life Stage Fund. Uh, with the uh, 1960s Life Stage Fund, it's designed for members whose retirement is between 15 to 20 years away. So the investment mix there is going to be a lot different to Sarah's, where it's a balance between growth and conservative assets. We then have Rose, who's 65 years old. She was born in 1948. Based on her age, she'll be invested in the 1940s Life Stage Fund. So Obviously, the investment mix there is going to be a lot different between hers, John's, and Sarah's in that 
the investment mix is going to be targeted towards uh, conservative investments, uh, obviously designed to minimise risk uh, so that uh, she can uh, keep her retirement savings and more importantly generate her income uh, once she transitions into retirement and draw down on her super. If we look at the next slide, it just goes, it just shows an example of how life stages works and that obviously, uh, if I point you uh, to the left hand of the slide, um, obviously with life stages, uh, the younger you are, the more aggressive the investment will be. And as you can see, going down the slide, as you get a lot older, you can see that through the uh, um, investment that it does sell down and ultimately as you get a lot older and you're close to retirement age, uh, the investment mix is going to be a lot more conservative where the majority of your money will be in defensive assets and only a small portion in growth assets. Um, we've talked a lot about the default investment options and uh, however, you do have choice of investing in particular sectors if that's the way that you do want to invest. So, for example, if you like what you heard from Andrew Clifford around international markets, you can choose to invest in international equities as a single investment option or as part of an overall diversified portfolio. So, if you do want diversification, you can choose your own investment mix across different asset classes and by different percentage allocations. Uh, an example could be that you allocate 50% of your money in international shares, 25% in Australian shares, and then 25% in conservative assets such as fixed interest and cash, as an example. Most of the super funds out there do offer the option of not just investing in different asset classes, but also the option to invest with different fund managers as well. And here are just some examples that I've listed here of fund managers you can invest in, such as A&P, Colonial, Perpetual, and obviously Platinum. The number of choices of different fund managers will differ from super fund to super fund. However, typically, most corporate master funds will offer some choice, and obviously, if you're running your own self-managed super fund, you have the flexibility to invest in any, super, in any fund manager you like. I've got a slide here which goes through the investment returns of different asset classes since 1985 and as you can see not all the asset classes perform the same nor do they perform well every year. So with that in mind investors should take note that past performance is not an indicator for future for future performance. So it's important to keep this in the mind and most importantly I'd always encourage investors to seek advice from a financial advisor before making any investment decisions. When considering an investment selection, you really should take into account uh, uh, risk versus return. And if we look at this slide here, uh, we look at cash, you can see that cash has a low risk. However, with low risk does come as low return. And if we look at the other spectrum, shares, shares are obviously uh, give you higher returns. However, um, higher returns does mean higher risk. So uh, that's something that investors should keep in mind when um, selecting investment choice, uh, risk versus return among the four asset classes. We often guess, get asked what investment options should, should I invest in or what should we invest in. And I suppose the easiest way for advisors and planners to assist you is to fill in a risk profiler. Um, the risk profiler has a list of questions which determines the type of investor you are enabling you to make the right investment choice. So if we look at the slide here, we've just got some sample questions and I'll quickly go through it. For how long do you expect most of your money to remain invested before you need to access all of it? Your answer could be less than three years, particularly if you're close to retirement, or it could be to the other spectrum. If you're a lot younger, it could be longer than 10 years. So when you're answering this question, you either tick uh, less than three years if you are close to retirement, or if it's more than 10 years, then you tick F, and this is something you can also use uh, with your partner as well. Look at question three, how familiar you are with investment markets. Uh, if we look down the, uh, the, the, uh, the answers there, it could be that you have very little understanding or interest, or you're not very familiar, and have some, but have some exposure to investing, or it could be that you're a very experienced investor. So in that case, you would, you would select E uh, as your choice with the answer. 
Once you've filled out the risk profile, it then determines the type of investor you want. So if we quickly go through this slide here, um, it could be that after answering all those questions that you you are a, I suppose, what we consider as a defensive investor. So your attitude to risk is quite low and you don't want a lot of volatility uh, with respect to your investments. So basically you'd be looking at um, uh, investments that are quite conservative, so you're willing to trade off higher returns uh, in favour for uh, more secure investments such as cash and fixed interest. However, if you go to the other spectrum and you're a high growth investor, uh, then your attitude to risk is uh, a lot higher and you're willing to accept the higher volatility to achieve higher returns, which means that you're willing to look at investments uh, that are growth orientated and possibly into speculative investments as well. So once you fill in the questionnaire, that really help uh, determine what type of investor you are and uh, advisors and planners can then assist you to make the right investment choice uh, once you've filled in that questionnaire. So just in summary, in the summary, sorry, you can make an investment switch by either filling in a form or via online, depending on your super fund. And most super funds will allow you to switch to another investment option uh, anytime. Uh, you can also uh, either switch uh, the full amount of your super fund or partial amount, and that obviously can be switched into any investment option. And also, you can also uh, choose an investment option for future contributions as well. But what we do encourage uh, all investors is obviously speak to a financial advisor prior to making any investment decisions. So this concludes the webinar for today. Um, hopefully you found the webinar informative and useful. Uh, as mentioned in the webinar, if you have any questions, you can direct these to myself or my team. So, um, Tony, Tony Douglas looks after our Queensland, New South Wales and Northern Territory clients. So if you're in any of those states, by all means, make contact with Tony. Uh, we also have Dylan Creswell. Dylan looks after our Victorian clients, uh, Western Australian clients and Tasmanian clients. And Anaya Perez, along with Tony, looks after our Queensland market. So if you do have any questions, by all means, you can direct these to me, or alternatively, you can direct these to Tony, Dylan, or Anoma. Um, before we finish up, uh, we've also recorded the webinar. Uh, so we'll be sending this out to all those that have registered for today's webinar, along with a copy of the slides. Once again, I'd like to thank this opportunity to thank uh, Andrew Clifford from Platinum Asset Management and Julia McCormack. Uh, for helping us organise um, uh, today's webinar. I'm sure you'd all agree it's important for us not just to look at investment opportunities here in Australia, but also overseas. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening in and enjoy the rest of your day.